Ever heard a painful pop in your finger after a crimpy move? Or maybe it was during that big dino that you face planted on? If so, you may have sustained a pulley injury. Pulley injuries are really common in climbing, making up 15 to 20% of all injuries. As a hand therapist and climber, I get asked about them all the time. So in this video, I'm gonna break down the anatomy of a finger pulley, how finger pulleys get injured, grades of injury, injury prevention, and how I personally like to fabricate a pulley protection splint. So what are finger pulleys? Your finger flexor tendons are like climbing ropes and your pulleys, five annular and three cruciate act like anchors, keeping those tendons close to the bone. But not all pulleys are equally as important. Therefore, when we talk about climbing injuries, we mostly focus on the A2 and A4 pulleys, which are the strongest and most mechanically significant. They prevent your tendons from bowstringing or lifting away from the bone when you flex your fingers. So how do pulley injuries happen? Pulley injuries most often happen when you're full crimping, bending the middle joint of your finger, the PIP joint, while the DIP joint is hyperextended. This position puts massive stress on the A2 pulley. A full crimp can load the A4 pulley up to 3.9 times and the A2 pulley 31.5 times more than an open hand grip. That's why grip position plays an important role in these injuries. The gold standard for confirming a pulley injury is a dynamic ultrasound and measures the tendon phalanx distance, which is basically how far the tendon is pulling away from the bone when you move your finger. So you might be wondering, after a pulley injury, when can you get back on the wall? To understand when you can return to climbing, you first need to understand the grades of injury. The following treatment timelines are adapted from Schaffel and colleagues in their climbing book, Climbing Medicine. These grades range from grade 1 to grade 4B. Now, I won't be going over every detail in the chart, but here's a quick breakdown. Grade 1 is a strain. Most climbers can return to climbing by about six weeks. Grade two is a complete tear of the A3 or A4, or a partial tear of the A2. Return to climbing is usually around eight to 10 weeks. A grade three injury is a full rupture of the A2 pulley. Most climbers return in about three months. Grade 4A involves multiple pulley ruptures without visible bowstringing. Return to full climbing can take four months or longer. Grade 4B involves multiple ruptures with obvious bowstringing or a single rupture with complications like tenosynovitis. This often requires surgery and return to full climbing may take up to six months or longer. This table is meant as a general guideline. Please consult with a qualified health professional for guidance and the most up-to-date treatment recommendations for your specific injury. So let's talk about H-Tape. It's super popular because it's cheap, quick to throw on, and it can help. In fact, research shows it can reduce bowstringing by 15 to 22%. Basically, it limits how far the tendon can pull away from the bone when your finger is loaded. So here's the problem. Tape only works if it's placed perfectly and stays tight. And we all know what happens mid-session. You start sweating, the tape shifts, it loosens up, and now it's giving you way less support than when you first put it on. Splinting though is a different story. A well-made pulley ring splint can give you consistent, unchanging support. It doesn't slip, it doesn't loosen, and it keeps the tendon exactly where it needs to be. It means less bow stringing, less pain, and a safer path back to climbing. So here's the bottom line. If you've got a mild injury and just need a little extra help, H-Tape is fine. But if you want more reliable protection, especially for a more serious tear, splinting is the way to go. What does a pulley ring splint do? Mika Schneeberger and Dr. Andrea Schweizer developed a pulley protection splint, a custom thermoplastic ring with lateral bulges to avoid compression of the neurovascular bundle. Their 2016 study of 47 climbers with confirmed grade 3 pulley ruptures, the pulley protection splint significantly reduced the tendon phalanx distance, helping tendons heal in a more anatomically accurate position. Even better, almost 90% of participants returned to their previous climbing level within 9 months. That's awesome. So now, I'm going to show you how I personally like to make a pulley protection splint adapted from their design. Disclaimer, this video is for educational purposes only and is intended for healthcare professionals trained in orthotic fabrication. Follow your local scope of practice, facility policies, and manufacturer instructions. Use clinical judgment and standard infection control precautions. Proceed at your own risk. Results may vary. 
Step 1. Prepare the splint pad. Add splint netting so that the thermoplastic won't stick to the base. An optional drop of dish soap can also reduce sticking. Heat the water to about 160 degrees or as recommended by the material manufacturer. Step 2. Set up the mandrel. Use 16 to 18 gauge wire. 16 gauge creates a more pronounced lateral bulge and 18 gauge can work with smaller fingers. Tape one wire on each side of the mandrel exactly 180 degrees apart to create lateral relief channels that help avoid compressing the digital neurovascular bundles. Step 3. Measure the width of the proximal phalanx where the ring will sit. For most adults, that's 1.5 to 2 centimeters. Use a ring sizer to determine the circumference at the target level. For me, I'm a ring size 5, so I would use tape measure over the modified mandrel to determine the length of the splint. Step 4. Using a utility knife or splint shears, cut a rectangle to the measured width and circumference. Thermoplastic is rigid when cold and becomes pliable after heating. I tend to gravitate towards aquaplast or polyflax by Rayoleum. Step 5. Soften the piece in the pan. Remove, pat dry, and round the edges while pliable. Step 6. Form over the mandrel. Drape the warm material over the wired mandrel and wrap to meet the measured circumference, ensuring the lateral bulges align over the rails. If you're forming directly on the patient, confirm that the plastic is cooled to a safe temperature and have them wear a stocking net to protect their skin. Aim for a snug fit that will allow capillary refill and normal sensation. Expect a couple of reheat cycles. Use a heat gun for small adjustments or briefly re-dip the edges in hot water. Lightly warm the exterior with a heat gun and press the Velcro firmly to bond. Be mindful of adjacent fingers and cover any abrasive edges with strap material. Rigid sports tape like Luca tape can secure the ring as well. I prefer hook and loop for reusability and micro adjustments. Lastly, Add moleskin or adhesive padding to reduce friction and prevent pressure sores. And there you have it. So how do you prevent pulley injuries? A lot of climbers jump on the wall without warming up. I used to be guilty of this. But that can seriously spike your risk for injury. Therefore, before climbing, I personally like to start with active range of motion and light loading of the fingers, wrists, and forearms, along with a full body warm up. Then, the authors of Climbing Medicine recommend a climbing specific warm up that involves 8 to 12 easy boulder problems for roughly 3 to 4 routes, with 40 total climbing moves with increasing intensity. I've had my fair share of my own injuries, and so I do this before every climbing session now. If this helped you make sense of pulley injuries, like, subscribe, and check out my other videos on climbing injuries and recovery. I'm a certified hand therapist and climber. Bye for now.